your girl Melody Almay and welcome back to another banger baby and happy new year it is 2024 already that's so crazy I feel like this year has flown by and we're already on the first video of the new year thank you my baby so much for five years on this channel it's been five years I feel like 2023 has flown by and now we're already starting our first video in 2024. I'm gonna honestly stop beating around the bush and right, get right into my video. As you guys can read by the title description, I will be giving a reaction video. My first reaction video of the new year and I will be reacting to Hamer's book, Juked. Oh my gosh, y'all, this book is a read, okay? Mind you, I have not read. <laughs> any type of book since probably I was in middle school, like Junie B. Jones. Like I used to be a big avid reader when I was growing up, but this is really the first book that I really, really like got into. No lie, like when I first heard of that Mr. Hamer wrote a book, I was like, I was like, oh yeah, I'm reading that because I really wanted to know Mr. Hamer's stance on all the controversy that happened when he got fired from being the director of the Southern University Human Jukebox. It was so much stuff that was going on and I know that a lot of people said things but there is never anything that he said from the horse's mouth. So today we will be hearing exactly what happened from the horse's mouth, okay? Mr. Hamer himself. I'm honestly so excited to give this review because y'all, this book is spicy. It's crazy, like, and then looking back in retrospective from, if, as you guys know, I was a dancing doll from 2015 until 2017. In my three year season as a dancing doll, Mr. Hamer was my only band director that I've known. And to give you guys a little background about how my feelings towards Mr. Hamer was before I was a dancing doll, I was scared of Mr. Hammer, okay? Everybody was on their toes around Mr. Hammer whenever they see him coming around the corner because he had a lot of power in that band hall. Not only did he have a lot of power in the band hall, but everybody respected him from the band members all the way to the dancing dolls, to the sponsors, to the directors, everybody loved and respected Mr. Hammer. That's how it was, that's how the... <laughs> the vibes were and to give you guys a little insight of how i felt about mr hamer was of course i was scared when i first tried out for the dancing dolls and my first real conversation with mr hamer as you guys know during 2015 dancing doll tryouts when we had interviews so this is when we sat right here is a big desk and mr hamer is behind it and he's asking questions here and there but mostly Datara, who's on the right side of him is asking most of the interview questions and i'm answering it and one of the interview questions that Datara asked is, is that your real hair? And it's, of course this is not an interview question. This is like an off to the side conversation. Like she asked me if this is my real hair because mind you, at this point my hair is already sweated out from tryouts. And I was like, yeah, this is my real hair. Is that your real hair? I said it like, oh, is that your real hair? <laughs> And you could tell that she was like, the tar was kind of thrown off. And Mr. Hamer in his head, he was like, I like this girl. Like, she a little green, but you know, she all right. She all right. So I feel like that was like, kind of put my foot through the door with Mr. Hamer. He was like, yeah, she's gonna be my dog. So when the tar didn't call my name during 2015 tryouts, Mr. Hamer was like, hold on, one of my dolls is missing. Who is it? Cause she tried to play with me from day one, y'all. But anyway. So he was like, where is my missing dancing doll? So of course the missing dancing doll was me. I came out and yeah, the rest was history, but yeah, that was my first real conversation, real kind of glimpse of Mr. Hamer. And as the season progressed, I kind of went more and more and more into my show whenever I came around Mr. Hamer because Mr. Hamer made it known that at any point you can get zipped, whether you're a dancing doll, whether you're a band member, anybody like, you could be cut and somebody will replace you <laughs> and life would move on. And that was like a known, thing around the band hall. Be on your shit because at any point you can get cut and that's what it was. So every time I saw Mr. Hammer, I sat straight up and just shut the hell up, okay? And I remember when I was really, 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 really <laughs> like messing up my crab year. Like I was, as y'all already know, I was the crab that didn't have it all together as the rest of the team because I was, because I had my reasons. I remember Mr. Hammer coming inside the doll room just to say, I heard you dance like a white girl. I had to gather myself and I was just like, I just had to take it. And as soon as Mr. Hammer walked out, I cried and Kayla was like, uh-uh, not in the doll room, no tears in the doll room. So I went to the bathroom and I cried, y'all. 
And honestly, I needed that because that gathered me to get myself together so I can improve and I can prove myself that I am a dancing doll, that I deserve to be here. And it just put a fire under my butt. So thank you, Mr. Hamer, for that, for telling me I dance like a white girl because <laughs> if I didn't get that push, honestly, no, it was Mr. Hamer and the fans, to be honest, because even though I did not read the comments my freshman year, I already knew. I already knew that they was talking about me because when it comes to the dancing dolls, the fans do not play. This is something that I've actually never shared to anybody, honestly. Uh, so this is the text message that I sent to him. I said, ooh, shy, Lord. I said, hey, Mr. Hamer, I know it's early, but I need you to know that I am praying for your return back to us. We seriously need you now more than ever. I know you are trying everything you can, but there is so much going on and you're the only one who can fix it. Just know if you need me, even without asking, I will be there supporting you every step of the way. There is nobody in this world that could ever take your place. You will forever be my band director. <laughs> and then this is what he said. I heard what happened upon my return. I will put you back on the line. So that was my standpoint on Mr. Hamer and what that's what he said. And I didn't even know that this is only his second year as band director when I came in. So like I said, whenever Mr. Hamer came in the room, everybody sat straight up and it was time to work and you better be on your shit or you will be cut. And that was the reoccurring theme in the band hall and my thoughts of Mr. Hamer as a dancing doll. So fast forward into the end of my third season as a dancing doll to the banquet. So I remember so much controversy coming behind Mr. Hammer because first off the controversy behind our Chancellor Dumas which you you guys are gonna hear about all this when I get into reviewing the book but it was a whole thing about him being fired not only because there was a whole sex tape coming out but it was a whole controversy with him let me just be real because y'all know me I don't beat around the bush straight to the facts y'all he was fired because there was a sex tape around the university with him and Miss Southern and it got out and they were like wow how can you do that and you got a whole sex tape out so of course you got fired <laughs> that's the controversy around that okay I just gotta be straight to the point y'all like that's the reason why he got fired and you guys could look into that yourself because I'm not gonna go too far Far into doing this. My whole thing is Mr. Hamer. So here is Mr. Hamer's thoughts about me, and I'm gonna react to it live here with you guys. So let's get into it. After my tenure as director, so that's not a question for me, because Melody is one of the girls I picked who had the look and who had the style and the grace. And she never should have been cut. I never knew she was cut. So if you tell me why she That's was fast. cut, I'm about to cry. Why? <laughs> really Y'all, yeah, Mr. Hammer is so funny. So, Marcy, why was she cut? Yeah, Marcy, why was I cut? I don't know. I know why you picked her, though. I know that. I don't know why you said that she was cut. I don't remember. Why did I pick her? Cut her. You know, it's a dog upside down. Right side up. Hey, I remember the story. Remember. Melody is a fucking dog. Y'all, this is why I mess with him. That's one thing. When I get in this mode and I start doing this, the guitars. Okay, whatever you say, you say. But I didn't give a fuck. Like, I picked my dogs. That's period. As a right. And Melody was a part of that. And I don't have no regrets. Melody is a motherfucking dancing dog. <laughs> And if you don't like it, that's on you. But I made her dance a dog. Based off of what she is, what God gave her. So, next. 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 And that's why I will forever stand 10 toes down behind Mr. Hammer because he gonna stand 10 toes down behind me, period. I feel like when Mr. Hammer left, everybody was just like, chickens with their heads cut off. We tried everything that we could. So rewind back to the banquet. Everybody was like really excited because we had this great season and I never in my entire life thought that I would see Mr. Hamer buzz down and cry like he did during the 2015 end of the year band banquet because to be honest, I never thought that I would see him like that. And it wasn't a good feeling. I honestly commend him for staying strong and being there with us even through all that. And just to say how much he loved the band 
And the whole social media error is because of Mr. Hamer. So, without further ado, <laughs> I had this long-winded intro, but honestly, you guys, this video is not structured. Y'all know when I get to start talking, I can be, yeah. So we're just gonna go ahead and get into this video. If you guys like this video, make sure you guys thumbs up. Go smash that subscribe button and join the Mega Baby family. We're on the road to 20,000 subscribers. Happy New Year. If you guys are new to this channel, welcome. Go smash that subscribe button and smash the notification bell so you know whenever I make a new post. And let's go ahead and get into this video. So I have made notes because I started reading this book on the plane. Me and I have been little book club buddies ever since Mr. Hammer came out with this book. And we've been talking about it, y'all. We've been talking about it. And I'm not gonna tell you her thoughts on the book because I'm gonna let her speak on her thoughts about the book. But I'm gonna tell you what I thought. I enjoyed this book. Mr. Hamer is a great writer. Like, and he's a great comedian. He is so hilarious, y'all. We're gonna get into every single note that I've taken on each chapter. I made notes just so I can remember everything that I read and I can, of course, react to it with you guys. So bear with me. We're gonna be reacting to Juked and it has 34 chapters. Right now I've read up to chapter 22 and I'm like, let me go ahead and make this part one because I already know this is gonna be more than one part of this reaction video because there's just so much to digest and talk about. Like it's just so much. And I know that y'all want me to get into it cause I wanna get into it cause it's so interesting. So this book has 34 chapters and really the chapters aren't that long, which I'm grateful for. They're probably like, five to 10 pages long each chapter. It seems like the book goes faster than usual. And I love that because the way my mind goes is just like, get to the point, like get to the point. And Mr. Hamer, he gets to the point, but still like gives all the details that you need to know about the story and the situation. So let's go ahead and get into this book, Juked by Mr. Nathan Hamer. So he dedicates this book to all the band directors, past, present, and future, and band heads. If you're a band head, you know you know. Those who follow all the intricate details of band programs, and for all who just love marching bands and the excitement that they bring to sporting events. So that's what this book is dedicated to. Now we're for real, for real getting into it, my baby. It starts off with a foreword by his brother, Niles. If you guys don't know, Mr. Hamer has a twin brother that is a lawyer that looks somewhat like him. Him and Mr. Hamer are very, very close. Close. We saw Niles all the time. I actually follow him on Instagram as well as his wife. Yeah, they're pretty close. And they're very, very close to the band and the Dancing Dolls as well. So this is the Ford by his brother Niles. The Ford was written in the perspective of his brother Niles towards who Mr. Hammer was growing up. And Hammer singing and falling in love with the band. His brother explained the experience of being at a Southern University football game as quote, we were like two small flowers crowded in a forest of trees, which is a very, very interesting quote because surrounded by grown people trying to see the band. I was weak at Mr. Hamer beatboxing My Prerogative by Bobby Brown. Cause I love that song, it's my prerogative. They kind of put you on his level as a kid of how he fell in love with music. He really did put the human jukebox on a bigger social media platform in his reign as band director. That's what his brother Niles said at the end. So that was really all the notes that I had for the Ford for his brother Niles. And then we go ahead and get into this introduction, which is of course in the perspective of Mr. Hamer. So these are the introduction notes. So first note it was, so in the introduction he explained after he got terminated, he started to explain his side of the story to his family and friends finally. I really had no idea that Mr. Hamer served over a year in federal prison. When did he go to prison? That was so crazy. Like, I didn't even know that he went to prison. I knew that he got convicted of it, but I didn't know he actually served a whole year in federal prison. I don't think that what he, let me shut the fuck up, okay? I don't think that he deserved a year in prison, but let me get past that. So towards the end of the introduction, he warned you to read this with an open mind. Do not read it with a closed mind with all that he say, she say and everything. Read it with an open mind. I feel like society today, whenever they hear one thing, they just run with it. They never want to hear it from the horse's mouth. When you hear from the horse's mouth, you gain a different perspective and then maybe your thoughts may change. So have an open mind, not only in this case, but in life, have an open mind. And at the end of this introduction, Mr. Hamer has a picture of him looking away on the stairs with the quote, to thine own self be true. You can lie to me, but you can't lie to you. 
And that's his quote, okay? All right, with that being said, let's go ahead and get into chapter one. Okay, my babies, chapter one of Jute. Let's get into these notes. So it starts off by the explanation of how the verdict went. It kind of reminded me of when the band crowded around the administrative building to try to fight for Mr. Hamer and nothing happened. All of the people who loved, respected, and wanted to keep him here were heard by deaf ears. We all band together and we fought for Mr. Hamer and they already was like, no, we don't care. Our decision is final. And they just really just moved on with their lives. Just how like Mr. Hamer said that they would just move on with their lives about after they cut you, that's exactly what they did with Mr. Hamer. He honestly didn't feel like you're valuable as a band member or as a dancing doll because it seems like they don't care. And honestly, as reading this book, it shows you that they really didn't give a shit. But he added when it came to his verdict, it was no jury. It was just a judge because this was a hearing, not a trial, which was kind of confusing, but I don't really know politics or how the judicial system fucking works. So I don't know. I just continued reading. This scene also reminded me in the band banquet. I never thought I would see Mr. Hamer cry, like I said, but he bawled at the band banquet. And I didn't know that he was gone, that that would be the end of 15. The last lines of chapter one was powerful and urged you to want to read more, honestly, after chapter one, because it said, quote, my destination was to be the band director for Southern University and AM College Human Jukebox. And now I am a convicted felon. Here's my story. What? Doesn't that make you want to read more? Like what? My destination was to be the director of band for Southern University and AM College Human Jukebox. And now I am a convicted felon. Here is my story. Let's read on. Chapter two. So this starts off with Mr. Hamer getting a phone call early in the morning in 2014, before I even got to Southern, by the way, from the Board of Supervisors, telling him that he is being considered band director, but told him not to fight the new chancellor coming in, who is Dumas, mind you. I already explained that foreshadow about Dumas. Dumas, Dumas, you're gonna hear that name a lot in this book, okay? He had a big meeting coming up to determine if his interim was approved or denied. Interim is a bullshit title of stand in person until the real person comes in. So interim was stand in director after Mr. J, who was the previous director had left. So it was later revealed he had no idea who Dumas was coming in. He immediately heard that it was past mess between Mr. Hamer's father and Dumas father. So a lady in the elevator told him they done set your daddy up. They done set your daddy up. Black people, one thing they gonna do is be messy, okay? So he learned from day one, this is gonna be a messy ass job. He didn't even know who Dumas was. This is all like rumors that Dumas' father and Hamer's father had beef back in the day. They were business partners in some way and they had passed beef and it kind of just stemmed down to another generation, which is them. He learned with a position of power comes politics, AKA mess, that don't have anything to do with you, but affect you. It becomes generational curses because it's like, just because their fathers had unresolved beef, then it's went down a generation like, oh, don't mess with his son who had nothing to do with it. He was just born. What? So honestly, that's how it all stemmed off. Mr. Hamer getting hired as interim director and his new boss, which is the chancellor, was Dumas. And he didn't know anything about him besides that his father had some beef with his father and the lady in the elevator said, oh, they didn't set up your daddy. So yeah, y'all, that's chapter two. So now it gets into chapter three where Mr. Hamer recalled when he was young, his mom had him and his twin brother playing soccer. When he heard the band playing and instantly fell in love trying to mimic the Jaguar rock. I love to hear inspirational stories about how people found their passions and their purpose in life. And this is how Mr. Hamer fell in love with the band. So when he got this interim band director position at Southern University, he explained that they didn't pay him as much as he expected. He noticed that each new band director, the wage gets lower and lower and nobody says anything. I didn't even know about LaCara, his ex-wife. I didn't even know the man was married, y'all. Mr. Hamer was married? What? I didn't even know that. So he explains how he felt when he got the job. His heart was beating fast and him not having anything prepared, but he was glad that the meeting was over and everything was done. At the end of the chapter, he explains that the board was fighting over who would get the chancellor and they finally named Dumas. I didn't know the vice chancellor was the boss of the director of bands. I really did not know Dumas was Mr. Hammer's boss, but that explains a lot. I remember I didn't get my scholarship money from the band my crab year and I went to Dumas about getting housing and Mr. Hammer went the fuck off like he was like why didn't you come to me why did you have to come to Dumas and I was like I 
I didn't know. But Mr. Hamer was pissed. Now reading, I understand why he was pissed. Yeah, I really didn't know what was going on between them. So that was just a little side story. But Mr. Hamer later explains that he didn't care who got the position as far as vice chancellor. He would be willing to work with anybody, but then he learned that Dumas is quote, little did I know that the future would not be as bright as I hoped. The vice chancellor of student affairs is Brandon Dumas. He is the son of my father's former law partner, Walter, and now he's my supervisor. Unbeknownst to me that when little kids don't get their way, they take their ball and run home. So begins the battle. Okay, so then begins chapter four. Mr. Hammer said when he first stepped into the position, there was no training for his position, like every other HBCU job, only inherited problems. I laughed at the quote, I was thrown the hot potato and they were like, you're it, figure it the fuck out. <laughs> I can't imagine. Mr. J, who was the previous band director before Mr. Hamer, didn't keep his promises. He told him that when he would be the band director that he would show him the ropes, introduce him to the people that would help him be successful, but it wasn't at all like that. Nobody helped guide him at all when he got the position. Mr. J just stepped down and ran away. That's what he said. Mr. Hamer said that Mr. J stormed out of the administrative office because he didn't get paid enough money for all that he was doing. The band camp had a record high of 400 students from all over the world in 2014 and this will be the first event Mr. Hamer will be over and <laughs> the chief of staff said quote they send you up to fail baby so he had to hire a new assistant band director to help with him in the band camp and that was his first thing then begins chapter five so I put this note and I loved Miss Bird not only because she had my same exact last name spelled the same exact way but she was so sweet and she helped the band with everything they needed help with she was helpful in navigating the scholarship and travel budget for Mr. Hamer when he first got into the position of being in the room band director. The scholarship fund had been $90,000 for the entire band for the past 25 years. Let me repeat that y'all. The band scholarship fund has been $90,000 for the entire band for 25 years. Even though the price of tuition has tripled since 1989, tripled y'all. But it still stayed at $90,000 for the whole entire band, including the dancing dolls. You know how many bands members there are. So you have $45,000 for fall and the same for spring. So it's not like you get the full $90,000 for one semester and another $90,000 for the second semester. No, that's cut in half. $45,000 for the whole entire band, for the whole entire dolls for one semester. Mr. J would bet on students not meeting the GPA requirements so he could disperse the funds to those who excelled in academics. I remember that's being pretty broke. <laughs> Help us, we is broke. So at the end of chapter five, Mr. Hamer hired a marketing and brand management team, MBM team, who was Eric and Jabari. He trusted and respected Eric, but he didn't trust Jabari. He felt that he was a band hater. But Eric vouched for Jabari, saying that they were a team. So Hamer figured, keep your enemies closer. And that's really how he ended chapter five. That was kind of like a little foreshadowing on the marketing and brand management team for the human jukebox. Let's go ahead and continue to chapter six. So chapter six, Mr. Hamer scheduled an initial meeting with his new boss, who, which is Dumas, right? So Mr. Hamer said he didn't really know about Dumas, but like I said, he heard Dumas already talking shit about him and Dumas said what he thought about Mr. Hamer, which was he thought he was arrogant and jealous of his popularity. I put in quotes, LOL, like, <laughs> And this part, y'all, was so funny when he talked about how Dumas dressed. Let me just read the excerpt. So, quote, I looked at the vice chancellor before seating. Brandon Dumas was a young man, but he didn't dress the part. <laughs> I'm gonna try to read this through this without laughing. His style was from the 1960s or the 1970s. He dressed the way my grandfather did. He wore dress slacks with a SU polo shirt tucked in and the slacks were pulled over his belly button. The legs of the slacks were wide, not like bell bottoms, just wide like what an older man would wear. <laughs> just wide. <laughs> Hamer! <laughs> he wasn't lying though. He really did dress like that. Mr. Hamer claimed him and Dumas 
father were business partners at one time. Dumas probably knew more history than Mr. Hamer did, saying Dumas' relationship with his father was way closer than Mr. Hamer was with his father. Mr. Hamer kind of alluded in the beginning that him and his father were like not that close and he was stern on him and hard on him. So I don't think that they had a really, really close relationship as Dumas. So that's why Dumas knew more about Hamer than Hamer knew about Dumas initially before they met. So lastly, the last note that I put for chapter six was in this meeting, he spoke about all his concerns about being the interim band director. And he said the hour long meeting went well. So that's what he ended with, the hour long meeting went well. So then begins chapter seven. So chapter seven started off with Mr. Hammer calling the board chair to understand why they didn't care for him being the band director. And she said she was a straight shooter and said that Mr. Hammer was ghetto and did not know how to write music. What? Ghetto? Mr. Hammer said he wanted to go off but kept his cool. He even referenced her as the queen of Elizabeth II to his response. <laughs> Hilarious. By the end of the chapter, I didn't like the board chair either, honestly. I agree with Mr. Hammer on why he felt the way he did about her because I really hate dismissive people. One thing I hate is when I'm trying to explain stuff professionally and respectfully and you're trying to dismiss me. Then it gets disrespectful, but he said he kept his composure. People who really belittle you as a person just because they have a bigger or higher position than you really piss me off. But <laughs> I say that to say that I understand exactly how Mr. Hammer felt about that board chair and why he felt irritated. Chapter eight. So I noted that when Mr. Hammer met to discuss with his marketing and brand management team, which is Eric and Jabari, like I explained before, approval, he learned that Jabari had quite a concerning past from doing bad business down to his house being foreclosed on. Mr. Hammer then learned that he can hire his own assistant directors as long as they had a master's degree. He vouched for Brian Simmons, but he didn't have a master's and another guy named Eddie, but they didn't qualify. They wanted Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor was first introduced Introduced in chapter eight. Mr. Hammer said that Taylor was experienced, but rather than question his character, that can destroy the table. So it wasn't about Taylor's experience, it was about his character that Mr. Hammer questioned when it came to that position. So now let's go ahead and get into my thoughts about Mr. Taylor. During my last semester as a dancing doll, I got a call from Datara and Mr. Taylor saying that I couldn't try out for dancing dolls my last season. Mind you, they called me while I was driving. I had to pull over when they told me this news that I couldn't try out and their reasoning behind me not trying out is because of hazing allegations with aka and i'm like i was just so thrown off by that i was just like i have to meet with him tomorrow morning i have to meet with mr taylor i could not sleep that whole night i cried i wrote down word for word what i was gonna say to mr taylor my hands was shaking mind you during that time i was taking summer school so i could get my courses out the way so i can graduate on time so i think i had like a test or something the next day i didn't even study for the test all my mind was was meeting with Mr. Taylor so I could talk to him and try to convince him to let me try out because that's really messed up for them not to let me try out because of an allegation that wasn't even true. I had texted Mr. Taylor and I said, now was a nice time to meet with you. Came up to his office and I spoke with him and all of a sudden a Kai came from the back and sat down next to him on the desk and I was just like, Oh, so that's where you got the hazing allegations from was Akai. And then she sat down, she was just like, well, since we don't have any evidence of you actually hazing, we're gonna actually let you try out and everything's fine. Just, you know, make sure you're on your P's and Q's because hazing, we don't have any tolerance, la 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 la. So I'm like, okay, why are y'all playing with me? That's what I was thinking in my head, like, why y'all playing with me? And that's my initial red flag. Oh, I didn't fuck with Mr. Taylor because it's like, why would you even tell me I couldn't try out in the first place if it was just an allegation and I had to do all this? for you to tell me I can try out. So, fast forward, okay, to tryouts. I tried out with my craft sisters. We tried our best. Yes, yes, yes. That was it, right? As y'all know, time progresses and I never get a call back. I never hear from Mr. Taylor again. I just hear from the TAR saying that the scores didn't match up or wasn't as high as expected, so I didn't make the team. So I'm like, oh, no, it makes sense. Mr. Hamer is gone and now there's no nobody fighting for me in the band hall anymore. Mr. Taylor is the doesn't know, but he's not gonna fight for me. And clearly we know who's in charge and it's not Mr. Taylor. So I was like, 
Mr. Taylor, like, I'm not a fake person. If I see you and I don't like you, I'm not gonna speak, I'm not gonna smile. I'm gonna look past you as if you have never existed. I'm not gonna disrespect you. One thing I'm not is disrespectful, especially somebody who I did have some respect for at one point in time. Even though I never spoke with him on a personal basis because he really didn't speak in the hall to us or any of the dancing dolls while we were dolls at the point. I'm not gonna intentionally disrespect you if you didn't disrespect me. So I didn't speak. Every time I see Mr. Taylor, I just didn't speak. He felt that energy, he felt that vibe that I'm not gonna speak when I see you because I don't fuck with you and you know why. And I knew he knew why. Okay, my babies, you get the gist. That's my thoughts on Mr. Taylor and I kinda get why Mr. Hamer kinda questioned his character. So moving forward in chapter eight, Mr. Taylor got the position as the assistant band director. Mr. Hamer supervised the text to him, which is already bad business, and told him to use the funds from the band camp to pay Mr. Taylor's salary. He instructed him to go to the comptroller office and set it up and Mr. Hamer said that that decision haunted him for the rest of his career for several reasons to come. The marketing and brand management team, the MBM team like I told you before, was now official with their new motto, business as usual was no longer, which means that they finally was going to do things the right way and get more funds to the band by doing so. Mr. Hamer learns that the MBM team was more of a headache than the actual band and he had to play closer attention to them every single day, which kind of sounds like a headache alone. Chapter nine. Dang, we're kind of moving through this, yes. The MBM team, AKA Jabari, didn't like that Mr. Hamer hired someone to do a documentary on the band's history. Because honestly, it has never been done before because it wasn't bringing any funds to the band. Not because it's been giving the history of the band, but because it's not giving funds to the band, which is kind of like money hungry mindset. Mr. Hamer said Jabari was getting on his last nerve. He just had to hang up in his face because he was now regretting ever vouching for him and putting him on the team in the first place because who are you talking to? I'm supposed to be giving the orders and you're supposed to be following, not the other way around. So that's why he just hung up. Also, Dumas started having problems with Hamer referring to the class of 2014 as crabs because of the hazing case back in 2008. That's just tradition. A new member of the band is a crab. Whether you're a dancing doll or a band member, you're a crab your freshman year. It's not a hazing term. That's just the legacy. But Dumas did not like that. He said that at this point, he became a micromanaging pest. <laughs> Mr. Hame was introduced to Sonia Norwood, Brandy and Ray J's mama, by the way. And he would further explain that she was responsible for many events, ventures, projects that the MBM team actually took credit for, but she did. And he didn't even share the conversation that they initially had because he still has so much respect for her and all that she did to help him with the band. With that being said, let's continue on chapter 10. So in chapter 10, this is crazy. So Mr. Hamer finally admits that he wrecked his car because of long practices, because of his quote, all night is all right, which literally still gives me nightmares to this day. Jeez. All night is all right was referring to until we get it right, we'll be all here all night. And that was Mr. Hamer's quote, all night is all right. And because of that quote, he fell asleep behind the wheel and ran into a median on the highway, y'all. That's so dangerous. That could have been went so much worse. He said that that was literally a wake up call. He said in that moment of the crash, he realized why stress over things that aren't that important, honestly. You're here one day and gone the next and the world will keep turning as if you never existed. He said, quote, you're going to kill yourself trying to prove something you don't need to prove. If SU doesn't make you permanent director, then quit. Life is too precious for you to be doing this to yourself. This is what he said to himself in his head when he crashed his car on the highway after falling asleep behind the wheel after long practices. This is what a wake up call like to him. He was just like, let me value my life better instead of just prioritizing everybody else before myself. Mr. Hammer also explains that you make plans and God laughs at them, which is pretty true. He said that his accident was just the beginning of God's comedy tour. <laughs> Mr. Hamer began explaining the first game against a PWI. The lady Amy instructed for him to keep on a headset to hear any promotions that they play because during that time, the band was not allowed to play. Either band was not allowed to play during any of the promotions. He ignored her <laughs> instructions and played anyway in regular Hamer fashion. This really, really was similar to the stuff that I have to go to as a dance instructor at a PWI. As you guys know, I am one of the dance coaches for the Cardinal Divas for the University of Southern California. And all the stuff that we have 
have to go through all the little stupid rules and traditions that we have to go through where the girls can't dance are stupid as hell and honestly not needed as you guys know they're not even allowed to dance halftime on the field because of their rules and regulations that a pwi has so i really do understand where mr hammer is coming from with this and how frustrated you can get in these pwis because they really are just racist that's really the real reason they just being racist but on the brighter side mr hammer said that the band was finally getting the social media attention that it needed and their new logo being plastered all over their content made them the forefront of a new age of a technological revolution and that's facts the human jukebox was the first to revolutionize the role of marching bands in the social media age and all the rest of the bands took the human jukebox as a blueprint and began to duplicate our professional look as the time goes on. So that's how Mr. Hamer ends chapter 10 and that's facts. If you don't know, then check the receipts. I don't need to prove myself when it comes to that. So then begins chapter 11. I noted that the human jukebox had quickly became popular just by their first two PWI games. Now it was time for them to finally go up against an HBO HBCU, which is all corn to show that they can really blow them out of their own stadium. Indeed, during the first battle of the bands against JSU, Mr. Hamer said what looked good on paper was a disaster in real life. When they had planned it and everything, what looked good on paper was a disaster. They put the band in six different motels and these motels were dirty as fuck. The issue was finally resolved after a lot of heated discussion between Mr. Hamer and the travel agent. After all that, the Dean of JSU called saying that they could get the band in the Marriott downtown Jackson. He said that he wished he would have known that earlier because all of the students had already lodged their stuff in three hotel rooms that they booked from the travel agent. So they just had to go with it basically. So basically JSU fucked them over once they had got there. But the band continued to blow down JSU at the Battle of the Bands. But Mr. Hammer continued that the next day was hell at the Battle of the Bands as they had to check out of the hotels at noon and the game didn't start till six. So the band didn't have anything to do for six hours. And they went to eat and attempted to practice at the practice field, but the grass was overgrown and not leveled out, so they couldn't practice at all. By the time they made it to the game, JSU PD officers stopped the band from entering and said, this is our house. We will tell you when you can come in. <laughs> you know what Mr. Hammer did, y'all? I love how Mr. Hammer handled this, by the way. <laughs> he walked right past the officer and he said, blade head, which started the cadence and Kayla, the captain at the time, the Kayla Pittman, strutted the dolls right past the officer with the band following behind. And when they got to the stands, there was another officer who said, come here right now, come here right now. Hammer looked around wondering who the hell she was talking to, saying, I'm not leaving my students, you come here. I said, so I'm gonna read his response on the top of page 59. The officer finally made it to me, quote, what is your problem? I should arrest you. Mr. Hamer said, arrest me for what? I understand that y'all didn't want us to come into the stadium before your ban, but please tell me what law that I broke by entering an open stadium on game day, which is my job description. I understand the rivalry between the schools, but are you an officer of the law or are you an officer of your feelings? <laughs> Are you an officer of the law or are you the officer of your own feelings? The officer didn't even respond to me. He just walked off. It was a good thing that I had the SUPD with me, not only because the officer at the gate lied and told my supervisor that I cursed her out. The SUPD chief fixed the situation for me because I probably would have been arrested for cursing out the JSUPD had the SUPD had not been present. Whoosh, ha. In October 2014, Mr. Hamer finally got his pay and was officially the permanent director of band. But on the downside, this is messed up, y'all. They still had this position open and he still had to apply for the job he was already doing. He finally got the position after five months of hard work and a pay increase that he finally deserved. But he ended his chapter with the notorious B.I.G. famous quote, Mo money, mo problems. So you guys, as I'm doing this reaction video, I'm realizing that this video is probably gonna be a little bit lengthy. I'm gonna come out with a part two, but I'm going to go ahead and react to up to chapter 15. And then in my part two, I'm gonna react to chapter 15 to chapter 34, okay? So we're gonna do it halfway. I feel like that will make more sense because as you can see, there is a lot to unpack. So let's go ahead and get into chapter 12. So Mr. Hamer said after 14 years in his career at the young age of 36, he finally had his dream come true as being the band director. He's seen his time of retirement far, far ahead at the young age of 36. He also stated that being at the young age of 36, he also didn't care about consequences. 
this. He really didn't. He also said during his young years as band director, he had a lot of fights and bites, which would be the attributing factors to his downfall. This is what he said. He said that at the end of Bayou Classic 2014, he started to get a bull's eye on his front, which is kind of confusing because isn't a bull's eye on the back, but he said he got a bull's eye on the front, okay? The Bayou Classic marriage proposal went viral, but administrators were mad because a diamond company that worked with the man during the performance said that he paid Mr. Hamer to do it, which Mr. Hamer did not get paid to do it. Hamer was appalled that they thought he received a payback. Mr. Hamer went on to piss them off some more by recording a video showing the rundown band equipment, the rundown uniforms, the leaky ceilings, the floors needed to be replaced and the walls needed to be painted in the band hall as a message from Nathan Hamer, <laughs> which is still up on YouTube to this day, I believe. But when he went to do miss about the repairs and sent him the video before posting on social media, because Mr. Hamer knew if he didn't send it to them without their approval, he would be immediately fired. Dumas told him use the funds from the band's budget, but the band had no budget. They were using the extra money to pay Mr. Taylor's salary and other expenses that the university should be paying out of their pocket. So Mr. Hamer included at the very end quote that it will be easier to get rid of Mr. Hamer rather than to fix the problems of the institution. But he had to do what he had to do to get the attention that he needed to get it done because these things had to get done at the end of the day. And y'all, if you hear the little munchies in the background, ignore Chuchi cause he decided to eat his kibble all of a sudden. So just ignore the little things in the background. So continuing to chapter 13. So chapter 13 was kind of a little bit on the short side. So I only wrote one note for chapter 13 and Mr. Hamer starts to realize that the MBM team is becoming a waste of time basically in chapter 13. While they were doing a little sum sum, Sonia Norwood was more instrumental when it comes to to helping with revenue and exposure towards the band. Let's get into chapter 14. So after the 2015 Honda Battle of the Bands, which was amazing by the way, legendary, Hamer said that he wasn't just physically tired, but tired of all the problems basically. This dream job had become a nightmare, that's what he said and he was just tired of the job, okay? And it sounded tiring, shit. The 40,000 deficit the band was in took a huge toll on Mr. Hamer. That when Sonia reached out to him, he just vented everything that he was going through as far as the 40K deficit. The next day, Sonia called him and said that she had a solution for the 40K deficit, but she went on to say that she does not like Dumas because he told her that the band was not a priority. She said for him to say that, that was disrespectful, which I agree. For that being your job and saying that the band is in priority, but yet you use the band to your disposal every time you need it, that's disrespectful. So Sonia said that she made it clear to Dumas that he made an enemy out of her and she was going to hold his feet to the fire. <laughs> Mr. Hamer found out the band had a way more funds than he was brought aware of. And all of those funds were going straight into Dumas and his colleagues' pockets. So basically the Vice Chancellor Office of Affairs, Student Affairs, that's what it's called, Student Affairs. It was going into their pockets and not the band. Thanks to Sonia, we were able to get the $40,000 for scholarships. And then due to lack of training, Mr. Hamer stated he did not have access to the budget until now. He said that he realized that he was always set up to fail. He began to question Mr. J towards the end of the chapter. He said he was deeply hurt because he loved and respected Mr. J and he basically set him up to fail due to his lack of instructions and sudden departure. So now we get into chapter 15. This chapter, chapter 15, it gets spicy and then it gets even more spicier and then it gets even more spicier. But I had to save it to part two for after chapter 16 because the video was getting a little bit too lengthy. So I'm going to have to put it in two parts. So in chapter 15, this was the beginning of parade season. The band prepared by marching around the campus for hours, giving students and faculty school spirit to make their day brighter. I loved this, by the way, when I was a dancing doll. Strutting around campus, saying hey to friends and faculty. During parade season, the band gets paid to perform and the directors receive an honorarium for each parade which I didn't even know that the band directors received anything besides getting paid from the institution. But Mr. Hamer said during the parade season, the band gets paid to perform and only the directors receive an honorarium. Mr. Hamer said Mr. Taylor started to get sneaky by asking Brian to ask Mr. Hamer about them receiving an honorarium. And Mr. Hamer said he would see, but he knew that assistants do not receive an honorarium, only the head band director. So you know when parents say we gonna see, but they're not about to see nothing. Mr. 
Mr. Hammer actually did see though. He said that in the 2015 parade season was the first time Mr. Hammer paid his assistants an honorarium. That would be the first time that he paid an honorarium outside the norm and he would continue to pay them. The administrators were mad that they did not get tickets to the Mayweather boxing event that the band was invited and performed at. They also stated that Mayweather gave Mr. Hamer a bag of money, but he denied that he ever received any money. Mr. Hamer later explained that that event opened up doors that money can't buy. He learned that the band's funds were paid to Dumas and used by him and his cronies. Mr. Hamer kept this information confidential so it wouldn't come back up and blow back up in his face. So he kept this information confidential. Mr. Hamer was livid because he was accused twice for receiving kickbacks, the parade in Mayweather, all while Dumas was recovering money earned by the band that they needed. As a result of attempting to protect the band's finances by not carrying a load of money in a briefcase to a game, which was usual for band directors to do. Mr. Hamer said previously Mr. J did that and the briefcase was of course stolen. Whenever he took his eyes away for one second, of course the briefcase was stolen. So Mr. Hamer tried to avoid this at all costs. Mr. Hamer went on to say that he made one of the worst decisions he made in his whole career. The decision that he made was to fund Mr. Taylor's salary with the band camp revenue. He felt he had no choice because the institution Southern University had put all the weight and all the problems on his back and administrators left him to fend for himself because he had no proper training, no proper instructions on what to do. He was forced to treat the band program as his own private enterprise basically. He ended this chapter giving advice to band directors not to ever make this mistake like he did. I quote, to all the band directors or those who aspire to be, never allow an institution to put all the weight and problems of the program on your back. If they aren't willing to partner with you and have some skin in the game through guiding you along the way with competent supervision and training on school policies and procedures, walk away. Your life, your sanity, and your freedom are worth more than trying to be a superhero with the mentality, I alone can fix this. When times are tough, I was left alone to fix the problems on my own. When the money and solutions to the issues that plagued the human jukebox started to come in, suddenly the administration wanted to question me or help themselves under the guise of helping me. Okay, my babies, I'm gonna get into the last chapter reaction of this video, okay? Chapter 16, and then I'm gonna go ahead and continue chapter 17 through 34 in the last part two reaction to this video. So make sure if you guys like this video, make sure you guys leave me a comment below and let me know what you think about all this. Thumbs up this video, and of course, go smash that subscribe button because we're on the road to 20K and we're gonna get there. We actually gonna get to 25K soon, okay? And make sure you guys get this video to at least 10K, you know, just get it to 10K real quick and then I'll post part two, okay? All right, my babies. So chapter 16, let's get into it. Mr. Hamer finally starts getting into my crab year, which is 2015 through 2016 academic school year. As usual, financial aid was a mess. I mean, what HBCU financial aid is not a mess? Mr. Hamer said he submitted names and scholarship recipients a month before and they still haven't been received by students. And the students weren't allowed to move into campus dorms until all all fees were paid. Sounds familiar? Mr. Hamer said he called the director to no avail. His main line of communication is through text, but he wouldn't even respond to that. And he called his supervisor Dumas to no avail. So he said, quote unquote, fuck it. I got students and band members in my hall with nowhere to go. And Dumas wants the freshman to perform. I'm tired of him using us up, but never coming through. Oh, Mr. Hamer said, they're not answering the phone or they're not showing up. Mr. Hammer sent one final email to Dumas, and as soon as he pressed in, Dumas showed up to the band hall like, what the fuck? Mr. Hammer stood his ground for the students and parents and was like, do you wanna talk to them in the hallway? Dumas didn't care, he just walked away, and the next day, housing was resolved. Mr. Hammer took this as a win, but he knew Dumas was going to be, quote, be a vengeful, whiny little brat. <laughs> Three days later, Mr. Hamer received a write-up from Dumas' assistant because he didn't want to face him himself. Mr. Hamer said, quote, I wanted to go to Brandon's office and beat the shit out of his cowardly ass using all of his expensive gadgets to hit him with. <laughs> you should have did it. Mr. Hammer went to the new president with his write-up and gave all his issues to him and Fulton claimed that the write-up won't go through because it was supposed to go through him first initially. But everything else he said, he just chuckled at and said, schedule a meeting with Dumas to talk about this quote unquote misunderstanding. And he did, but the meeting never took place. 
Okay, chapter 17 is to be continued in part two. Thank you, May Baby, so much for watching this reaction video. Oh my gosh. As y'all can see, this was a lot. But it was so much fun to react to this book. And it is such a great read. If you guys have any chance to read it, make sure you guys read it. I'm sure it's on all platforms. Get into it, May Baby. This is such a good read, May Baby. Go ahead and read Mr. Hammer's book so we can talk about it, okay? And I will catch you in part two of my reaction video to Juke by Nathan Hamer, okay? This is a read, honestly, a 10 out of 10 so far. I cannot wait to continue giving my reaction video with you, my babies. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and until next time, I will catch you in the next banger!